Everybody quarrels over the efficacy of the English longbow. Many historians, reenactors and history enthusiasts alike hold the view that arrows piercing armor is a myth. Some base this view on testing, as was done for example by Todd from Todd's workshop. Together with his team he provided an invaluable data point for this debate. Others, such as traditionalist historians, are often open to the possibility of arrows piercing armor, even though they are aware of actual testing of the longbow. In general, the efficacy of a weapon is much more complicated than its mere armor penetration value. So in this video we'd like to shed light on the whole debate and explain why it is so hard to find common ground on this issue. This is why everybody disagrees on the efficacy of the English longbow. The debate is quite old, at least since the 1980s historians have disagreed on English longbows. In 1989 Clifford J. Rogers could already write a defense of the traditionalist view that was previously challenged by Cali de Vries in a 1949 publication. Subsequently the debate produced a number of tests which were mainly concerned with the armor piercing capabilities of longbows. Matthias Bain in 2006, Mark Stratton in 2010, a computer analysis by the Warsaw University of Technology in 2017 and the most recent tests by Todd from Todd's workshop. These tests produce different results. Some show that arrows could penetrate armor, some, such as Todd's, showed the opposite. It turns out that whether an arrow actually penetrates armor or not is a multifaceted question. It depends on a multitude of factors, such as the strength of the armor, the strength of the bow, the type of arrow, how the bow is drawn, to the chin, breast or ear, whether an arrow is hardened, the thickness of the armor and so on. The best known test series today is certainly the one done by Todd. He and his crew did a great job and you should check out his videos. But make sure to have a look at all of his videos on this topic. Especially the follow-up videos in which he talks to the historian Dr. Tobias Capwell are vital to fully understand the issue. In these follow-ups they make it clear that they never wanted to deny the efficacy of the longbow in general. They simply wanted to test whether an arrow loosened from a longbow could penetrate a 15th century armor as it would have been deployed at Angincourt in 1415. Todd himself stated that his test is a data point, not the end of the discussion. However, Traditionalist historians such as Clifford J. Rogers or historians with more moderate views on this issue such as Cali de Vries hold the view that arrows fired by longbows could penetrate armor. So why do historians, enthusiasts and testers disagree fundamentally on this question? Well the issue is that many primary sources really state that the arrows of the English longbowmen were extremely effective and that they did penetrate the armor of the French knights. This will take a moment to get the point across, so bear with me. For example, one primary source, the Chronicon Comitum Flandrensium, says about the Battle of Crecy that the archers of the Prince of Wales, quote, pierced through horses and men with their arrows, end quote. And the chronicler Froissart speaks of the archer's shaft, quote, piercing the arms and breasts of the Genoese, end quote. Geoffrey Le Baker writes about the Battle of Poitiers that the English archers, quote, greatly and horribly pierced the French." End quote. But if you read closely, none of these examples explicitly mention arrows piercing armor. So maybe the longbow was only an effective weapon against less armored Scots, such as at the Battle of Halidon Hill in 1333, where they were butchered by arrows. Likewise, maybe they were effective against the less armored men-at-arms of the first half of the 14th century, but not later on. However, if this is true, how come that both King David and King Philip suffered wounds from arrows? They surely had the best armor available at the time. In addition, we actually have sources that positively state that arrows pierced armors. For example, Adam Murimov describes arrows and lances at Crecy, quote, seeking out the entrails of men just as those of horses, their armor rarely preventing it, end quote. Geoffrey Le Baker says that at Poitiers archers caused quote, their arrows to prevail over the armor of knights. End quote. The Chronographia Regum Francorum states that the English quote, attacked the French and killed more of them by arrows than by other ways. End quote. While these are all examples of earlier engagements, 
there are statements about the Battle of Angincourt saying similar things. John Lidgate wrote, quote, Our archers shot full-heartedly and quickly made the Frenchmen bleed. Their arrows went at great speed and took down our enemies. Through breastplate, hauberdon and bassinet they went, end quote. The French chronicler and eyewitness Jean de Vaurin reports that, quote, The French began to hold down their heads, especially those who had no shields because of the violent force of the English arrows, which fell so heavily that no one dared raise his visor or look up. Before they could come to close quarter, many of the French were disabled and wounded by the arrows, end quote. And here I'd like to add that Dr. Tobias Capwell asked for a compilation of sources that indicate armor penetration by arrows. So on screen you see a list of all the sources we came across. The burning question remains though, can we trust these sources? This is a very important question that needs to be tackled carefully and methodically. The methods historians use to answer such questions is often based on source criticism. Think of a historian as a judge and the sources as witnesses, much like in a courtroom. Historians ask their witnesses questions and determine whether they can be trusted. However, witnesses are often unreliable or lie. In the same way judges can simply believe witnesses, historians can simply believe the sources. Instead, historians form hypotheses and then test them against their sources. From a scientific point of view, they adhere to the principle of falsifiability. This is best summarized in the words of the influential German historian Reinhard Koselleck. Quote, As a historian, I'm not allowed to assert something that is in contradiction with the primary sources. End quote. Koselleck called this the veto power of the sources, which became an influential notion in historiography. It's obviously tricky to actually apply this. If you were to ask, for example, whether Louis XVI was murdered or rightfully punished, answers would differ because it depends on your point of view. But it'd be hard to argue that the guillotine didn't separate his head from his body. If you'd argue otherwise, the sources would use their veto power. In our case, it would be hard to argue the point that the English longbowmen were incredibly effective. The problem is that we don't really know in what way. Was it really armor penetration or something else? Still, the hypothesis that longbows could not penetrate medieval armor is in contradiction with quite a few primary sources, so the sources would use their veto power. Due to this, traditionalist scholars won't change their opinion, even if tests come to other results. These historians are skeptical of the tests. They argue that testers have a hard time to recreate medieval battle conditions. It's not just the type of arrows, bows and armors themselves, but also whether an arrow was shot at a moving target, which would result in a much higher velocity, or whether the arrow was hardened or not, and many more details of that kind. For some of these questions, like the hardening of arrows, we have no or only very limited evidence. So there are a few unanswered questions, such as, just how good was the average armor of the time? How many men were armored in the respective engagements? At what range was the arrow shot? Can we faithfully reconstruct an armor from the Middle Ages today, or will it always be somewhat different because we use slightly different steel or manufacturing methods? Imagine, for example, if even 30% of the armors of the French at Crécy were of low quality. That might already be enough for the English longbowmen to shoot the French to smithereens. Military historians usually point out that you need to wound or kill only a comparatively small amount of the enemy army to make them flee the field. As soon as you watch your comrades fall, you think about fleeing. If you shoot enough arrows at a mass of knights, and 30% of them would not have the armor needed to stop the arrow, that might already be enough to win. And this leads us to a more moderate view among historians. Let's say our sources were wrong. After all, chroniclers were rarely present at the battlefield and usually wrote their texts quite some time after the events. They were no specialists in warfare and might have misunderstood what actually happened. It might be that these medieval sources just say that these arrows killed knights through their armor, but instead they merely penetrated weak points. Historians who think like that tend to view the statements of medieval chroniclers as literary device. Think of a metaphor such as rain of arrows which is not literally a rain of arrows, but a volley. 
Similarly, a phrase like the earlier mentioned arrows prevailing over the armor of knights could simply refer to a victory over heavily armored mounted knights. Historians who accept the premise that longbows could not penetrate armor usually argue that the longbows could still be a successful tactical adoption. In fact, this is a common opinion among military historians, though not accepted by all. According to this view, longbowmen were deployed to the side of an infantry line consisting of heavily armored men at arms and used to slow down the enemy charge, then pepper them with arrows from the side. The slow charge alone would have been a crucial advantage. So, in a nutshell, tests show that it is very difficult to pierce armor. Chroniclers indicate that it might have been possible. Some historians follow the chroniclers. Others think that we can't trust the primary sources. They think that the English longbow was a successful tactical adoption rather than a technological innovation. Both sides apply fundamentally different methods. This case neatly but painfully demonstrates that no field of study is perfect by itself. There needs to be dialogue and debate between scholars and disciplines to rule out bad arguments and progress new theses. So, this whole case is actually a perfect display of work-in-progress historiography being done properly.